Well, brethren, God has once again been gracious to watch over us through the past night and bring us together. And let's seek his face with thanksgiving for all the blessings we've known from his hand in our previous time together, but plead for fresh grace for this hour. Let's pray together. Our Father, we are mindful of your word, which commands us to come before your presence with thanksgiving, to enter into your gates and into your courts with praise. And we do this morning bring the sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips making confession to your name, that you have shown yourself to be a gracious God to us in these days together. And while we are deeply grateful for every indication of your goodwill and your favor toward us, we would not presume upon this day, but we would acknowledge we come as beggars standing in need of fresh supplies of grace. And therefore we come to you not discouraged, not tentatively, but confidently believing that the promise of our Lord Jesus is held out to us afresh as a living word for this day, that if we ask, we shall receive, and we come asking, not asking to consume anything upon our own lusts, but asking for those things that we so desperately need and without which we cannot glorify you in our time together. Grant your Holy Spirit as the spirit of unction and power to me as I seek to lecture and preach and instruct. And may your spirit be present with all of us as the spirit of wisdom and of revelation, giving us understanding and discernment in your truth, and then giving each of us grace to feel the pressure of the application of that truth to our own consciences and to our own lives. Surely, Lord, it would glorify you to grant the things we've asked of you, and therefore we do ask in the expectation of faith through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Well, once again, brethren, we take up together this all-important question, what constitutes a biblical and an orderly call to the pastoral office? We began, after a general overview of the entire course in pastoral theology, to zoom in upon this question by identifying some of those foundational biblical principles which must condition our answer to that question. We then proceeded to examine the fundamental errors which often are present with respect to the answer to that question, and then looked at seven unbiblical and unrighteous reasons for which men aspire to the pastoral office and, alas, actually enter and remain in that office. Well, having, as it were, cleared the road of the obstacles and the debris of wrong thinking, we're now considering the four elements which comprise the components of a biblical and orderly, orderly call to the pastoral office. Reducing those four things to their irreducible minimum, I suggested the words aspiration, qualification, confirmation, and recognition. The first, represented by that word aspiration, the shortened version of an enlightened and sanctified desire for the work of the pastoral office. And here I want to say for those of you men who are present who are what would be described as ruling elders who have no aspiration to becoming an elder who labors in the word and in doctrine, I realize that much of this material does not apply directly to you with respect especially to the matter of gifts but remember the standard for graces and the minimal measure of gifts do indeed apply to you since the word of God does not hold forth a double standard for elders. The elder, whether he labors in the word and in doctrine or primarily engages in governing and shepherding, the elder must be. And there is no double standard. 
But I do appreciate your presence with us and your enthusiastic response to these things. But I want you to know that I'm very conscious of your presence and deeply appreciate the fact that you have assumed that I understand that some of these things do indeed apply only to those aspiring to labor in the word and in teaching. So, the first component of a biblical call to this office is this enlightened and sanctified desire for the work, the entire work of the pastoral office, and then secondly, a proven fitness for the work of the pastoral office, qualification. And I have suggested that that fitness breaks down into three major categories, Christian character, Christian experience, and the requisite gifts. And we've addressed those matters of the graces that must be evident, the tested, matured Christian experience that must be evident, and now we have begun to take up the presence of the gifts essential for fulfilling the purposes of the pastoral office. In our last lecture, I had time only to demonstrate from the scriptures the necessity for and the importance of the requisite gifts for the pastoral office and then the source of these gifts. And I come back to Owen, who has been such a help to me in this matter, reducing Owen to my own words, who insisted again and again, if you do not possess the necessary gifts, plural, from Christ, you are not a gift of Christ to his church. No gifts, no gift. For if indeed, as we read in Ephesians 5, Christ nourishes and cherishes his church, and one of the expressions of his nourishing, cherishing ministry to the church is giving to his church pastor teachers, surely it would not be an act of tender, loving nourishment to give as a gift the one who has no gifts to fulfill the function. Without gifts, you are no gift to Christ church. You may be an intruder into that office with sincere motives. You may have come into it because of the shoddy, unbiblical thinking of others, but you can never regard yourself as a gift of Christ to his church unless Christ has first of all granted you the gifts necessary to function in that office for the purposes for which Christ has instituted that office. Now, as we begin to work through the vital subject now of the identity of the specific gifts requisite for the pastoral office, here we will do so under four categories of gifts. Gifts which to one degree or another ought to be present and evident before any man should satisfy his conscience that he is indeed Christ's gift to his church to be a shepherd teacher to a specific flock of Christ. Now in this hour, I'm going to attempt to set before you the first of those four categories of gifts, and I'm describing it this way. The gifts which find expression in the disposition, capabilities, and acquisitions of the mind. The gifts which find expression in the disposition, capabilities, and acquisitions of the mind. Now let me take a moment, as I've done all the way through, to explain what I mean by those particular words. By disposition, I'm referring to that which is a prevailing attitude or characteristic. We say of a woman, she has a sweet disposition. Or we may say of a man, he has an energetic disposition. I hope it is never said of any of us, he has an ugly, sour disposition. And when we use the word disposition that way, we are speaking of a prevailing characteristic of that individual. Well, I'm saying that there is a prevailing disposition of the mind that is 
and evidence of Christ gifting a man for this labor. By capabilities, I'm speaking of one's capacities given by nature, the amount of gray matter stuffed between our ears and its ability to function according to what God implanted in our conception and the disciplines by which that mind has been cultivated and, and strengthened to think clearly, to reason logically, etc. And then by acquisitions, I'm referring to what our minds have taken on board by study, by reflection, by observation, instruction, interaction. So, please track with me as I seek to identify five characteristics of the kind of mind that is ordinarily essential as a prerequisite for the work of the pastoral office. Five characteristics of the kind of mind that is ordinarily, not without exception, but ordinarily essential as a prerequisite for the work of the pastoral office. And at the head of the list, is what you see in your notes as number one or letter A, a mind which is reverently and lovingly submissive to the absolute authority of the scriptures, and I'd like you to add to your notes as the inerrant word of God. A mind which is reverently and lovingly submissive to the absolute authority of the scriptures as the inerrant word of God. In Titus chapter 1, when Paul is guiding Titus with respect to those men who, whom he ought to mark out and who ought to be recognized and installed as elders in the church at Crete, in verse 9 we read this essential requirement. He must be one who holds to the faithful word, which is according to the teaching. And the Greek verb antechomai means to hold on to something, to cling tenaciously to something. And the elder is to be one who patently clings tenaciously to what? To the faithful word, which is according to the teaching, which is Kata, according to, lines up with the teaching. What teaching? In the context, obviously, it is the apostolic teaching. It is the revelatory data that has come through the apostles, and since the apostles stood upon the entire Old Testament as already given revelatory data, it is right for us to extrapolate from Titus 1.9, holding to the faithful word which is according to the teaching involves clinging tenaciously to all of God's revelatory inscripturated data which we now have in the Old and the New Testaments, the Holy Scriptures. The apostle could boldly say to the Corinthians when giving what we would say were rather practical and mundane and necessary directives for sorting out the charismatic free-for-all and zoo that was, uh, was there at Corinth. After giving all of these specific directives about one or two and no women in this and no uh, men more than this, Verse 37 of 1 Corinthians 14, If any man thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him take knowledge of the things which I write unto you, that they are the commandment, the entole, the authoritative revelation of the will of the Lord. Paul was very conscious that he was speaking as the mouthpiece or writing as the penman of God. And likewise, when he writes to the Thessalonians to commend them and to look back with gratitude upon the work of God among them when he preached in their midst, he writes 1 Thessalonians 2.13, And for this cause we also thank God without ceasing that when you receive from us the word of the message, even the word of God, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, 
which also works in you that believe. There is a wonderful parallel between the way the Word of God has been given to us and the delightful way in which one called of God receives that Word. What am I referring to? Well, simply this. How was that Word given? 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 13 tells us, The great mysteries that for ages and generations have been hidden, but are now revealed by the Spirit, we read in verse 12 of 1 Corinthians 2, but we received, not every ordinary believer, but the apostle, we receive not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is from God, that we might know the things that were freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in words, vocables arranged in sentences with syntax, which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Spirit teaches, combining spiritual things with spiritual words or interpreting spiritual things to spiritual men. That last part of the verse is difficult to know what is the best translation, but the point that I want to make is this. The apostle was conscious that as an organ of revelatory data to the church, that revelatory data was expressed in spirit-directed words. Not just general thoughts leaving to the apostle the choice of the words, and though there was the full engagement of all of his mental faculties, he was conscious that the very words which expressed and captured the thoughts were words superintended by the direct agency of the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself said in John 17, 8, in his high priestly prayer with respect to the manner in which the apostles received his word, for the words which you gave me, I have given unto them, and they received them, and knew of a truth that I came forth from you, and they believed that you sent me. The words, our blessed Lord was conscious that in his role as the obedient servant, he did not speak the thoughts of God in his own words. He sp spoke God's thoughts in God's words. The words that you gave me, I have given to them. Therefore, one called of God is given in a heightened way that which God gives to all of his people to some degree. He gifts that mind with this grace of reverent submission to the absolute of the authority of the word of the living God so that everyone, whom God is fashioning into an able minister of the new covenant, can say with the prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah 15 and verse 16, Your words were found, and I did eat them. Just as I found them, I consumed them. And your words were unto me a joy and the rejoicing of my heart, for I am called by your name. He did not say your words were found and I picked over them to separate the wheat from the chaff and then the finest of the wheat I ate. No, no. Your words as I found them, I ate them. They were all the finest of wheat. He did not say your words were found and I examined them to divide the ransom, the rancid from the wholesome. No, they were all the best of food. And since it is the whole of Scripture, which is breathed out by God and able thoroughly to furnish the man of God the gift of a mind, reverently submissive and receptive to the whole of Scripture, is an essential aspect of a divine call. Without that mind, no man has any right to intrude himself into this office. By way of further application, let me say that our posture before the Word is to be wholly receptive. Commit these things to faithful men who shall not question whether these things are true, 
Timothy, I've given to you the apostolic deposit. From a nursing babe, you've known the sacred writings. Timothy, commit these things to trustworthy men who shall, in receiving them, reverently and submissively pass them on to others. Or in 1 Timothy 4 and verse 6, he says to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6, if you put the brethren in mind of these things, the things that Paul has been laying out of the details of behavior in the house of God, in all of their meticulous detail, Timothy, take these words. In that sense, you are passive. You are a receptor of a legacy, the words of God, the apostolic tradition. Timothy, having received it, pass it on without any dilution, without any extraction. Or 2 Timothy 4, 2, where Paul gives his holy swan song to his son Timothy, knowing that shortly his head is going to plop into a basket somewhere in a place of Roman execution. And he says, Timothy, I charge you before the living God, before the Lord Jesus, and in the light of his coming and the full establishment of his kingdom, preach the word. Take the role of a herald who has a message from the king. Don't tamper with the king's message. You herald it as one who has received it. And then I love Isaiah 66 and verse 2. Isaiah 66 and verse 2. After God asks the question, asserting his own greatness, his ubiquity, he fills heaven and earth. Where are you going to take a house that can contain me? He says, I made all of these things. But now he says, this is the man I'll look to, not the one who's in a special place that thinks I can be contained in that place. No, no, to this man will I look, even to him that is of poor and a contrite spirit and that trembles at my word. Poverty of spirit is what we feel in the presence of God when we own our creatureliness with all the limitations of our creaturely mind. Contrition is what we own and feel in the light of our sinfulness, which has darkened our minds, which has twisted and put all kinds of kinks in our minds. God says, here's the man I look to, the one who owns from the heart his limitations as a creature, who owns from the heart what he is as a sinner, and then... When I speak and I declare what I know as God and what you need to know as sinful creature, you tremble before my word. You do not sit up as critic over that word or outside of it to reshape that word. You tremble in the receptive posture of the creature sinner before his holy creator God. I've said on many occasions when I can see people struggling intellectually with certain aspects of revealed truth that for us just don't seem to fit, I'd say, wouldn't I be a fool to go down to the Jersey Shore and when my feet are in the water as they were a few weeks ago, hadn't been there in years, on Island Beach State Park, take a teacup, fill it with the Atlantic Ocean water and stand up and announce to the world, I have the ocean in my cup. I can't contain the whole ocean in my cup. I can have a cup full of Atlantic Ocean water. But to think because my cup is full of Atlantic Ocean water, I have the whole of the ocean in my cup, I'd be considered a fool. You can never contain God and the revelatory data of God in the teacup of your little creaturely brain. And when we have thinking that rises up to breathless wonder and worship, that's being the man of Isaiah 66, owning the limitations of the creature and the humbling realities of the sinner, we tremble before that word. All who enter a pulpit or sit in a counseling situation or stand in a congregational meeting to give biblical direction to the people of God 
who in the slightest way have listened to and entertained the whispers of the devil in Eden need to have deep dealings with God if it's a temporary assault to the enemy, if it's a prevailing disposition of the mind, they ought to leave or never enter the ministry. Yea, has God said? when God had clearly spoken, and when that whisper would ever be entertained and sink down into the soul, a man has no business in that place where his posture is to be one of total receptivity before the words of God contained in the inerrant words of Holy Scripture. So, when we wrestle with the issue, what are the specific gifts essential to aspiring to and entering upon the pastoral office, when we identify this fundamental issue, I believe I've carried your judgment that it must be a mind that is reverently and lovingly submissive to the absolute authority of the inerrant Word of God. But secondly, of the five characteristics of the mind that are indicative of divine giftedness, a mind furnished with a grasp upon the basic contents of Scripture. That is, a general familiarity with the substance of the Bible in your own native language. For me, it's my English Bible in a good, reliable, formal equivalence translation in which people do not take the role of interpreter when they should be in the role of translator. And if we aspire to the office, and here this would include as well even those who have no aspiration to be laboring in the word and in doctrine, but simply to be good shepherds to the people of God in a lesser public role, you must have a mind furnished with a grasp upon the basic contents of Scripture. If the whole of God-breathed Scripture is given to make complete the man of God, it follows that one who is not acquainted with the broad substance of that inscripturated data is not complete as a man of God. Jesus said, quoting in De from Deuteronomy in Matthew 4, 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And if scripture is its own infallible interpreter, how can a man be a safe guide in the handling of any one of the individual parts who is not familiar with the quality control of the whole? 2 Timothy 2.15 Do your utmost, Timothy, to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that has no just cause to be ashamed of what he's doing in the handling of that word because he cuts a straight course in the word of truth. And so whether we are in a counseling situation, assessing what to do in a congregational crisis, seeking to guide the church in matters of discipline, surely, brethren, the shepherd teachers of Christ's church must have an acquaintance with the basic contents of the whole of their Bibles. How often must the Lord say to many who lead God's people astray or who constantly blunder with imbalanced and imprecise statements in public ministry, with stupid and irrational and unjust matters of congregational government, Matthew twenty-two twenty-nine: 29, you do err not knowing the scriptures. You err not knowing the scriptures. How often must our Lord say uh, to those in the place of government when there is ineptitude, unwise judgment, indecision on matters that ought to be addressed with, with haste and with confidence that the path of Scripture is clear. You do err, not knowing the Scriptures. And brethren, if we are to have such a mind, those of you who have yet to enter in upon this office, 
And if those of us who are in the office are to increase in this element of giftedness, minds increasingly and more fulsomely furnished with a grasp upon the basic contents of Scripture, let me give three suggestions or admonitions by way of application. Number one, this should cause us to understand why chronological age is relatively meaningless in a man's fitness for this office. It's said of Timothy that from a nursing babe he knew the Holy Scriptures. He got Bible with his mother's breast. Bible and breast were synchronous in Timothy. So, even though Timothy is a relatively young man, by the time Paul encounters him on his, I believe, second missionary journey, yes, Acts 16, Timothy is already manifesting such maturity of perspective and understanding, and Paul sees it. He gets the input of others in the two places, Lister and I think Iconium, the two places, and he says, there's a universal testimony. This man is soaked in his understanding of the Bible, though relatively young. What was the secret? God was putting it into him from the time he hung upon his mother's breast. And I have seen in my own experience men, young men in their mid-twenties, who, having had this privilege, knew more of the general content of their English Bibles than some men who'd been in the ministry for 25 years. And so I say that to encourage you young men on the one hand, but on the other hand, if you've not had that privilege, it means that you have got to determine, and here's my second admonition, to commit yourself to some program of systematic assimilation of the whole of your Bibles. Have some program whereby in one year, two years, three years, you are continually working through in some kind of an orderly way from Genesis to Revelation, and back again from Genesis to Revelation. Now, whatever your pattern is, you have to establish it. I have found in the, over the years a pattern that works best for me, but even then I have to change it occasionally because I get into that rut, the grave with the ends kicked out. And I find to keep my freshness, but brethren, there is absolutely no substitute reading through and generally, the suggestion I give to people, lest they get discouraged, do things sequentially. Don't start in Genesis and go straight through, because it isn't going to be long before you get bogged down in some of those sections of the Old Testament that seem to yield so little devotional fruitfulness that your spirit can begin to be shriveled, but working through Old and New Testament sequentially. For me, it's been a chapter of the New every day, for five or six days a week, gets me through the New Testament, approximately once a year. A couple of chapters from the Old Testament that gets me through my Old Testament once every two years. A psalm that gets me through the psalms approximately once every nine months. And for a number of years, one chapter in Proverbs that took me through Proverbs once a month. And in that way, my passion was that I might absorb the content of my English Bible. So that when I think, my Bible is conditioning my thinking. And when I think I see something over here in a New Testament passage, some light and pressure and quality control of an Old Testament perspective is brought to bear upon it. And in that conjunction, in the last 10 years, I have found... There are all kinds of books on my shelf. I can't even remember when I bought them. And there are no pencil markings on them. As I work through any book, I have my mechanical lead pencil in hand. When years ago, Ian Murray rebuked me for underlining in ballpoint pen. He said, you're ruining your books for whoever gets them after you. So I repented and I used mechanical pencils. But anyway, I came to the determination, Lord, there are a lot of those books I'm never going to read before I die but I want to know this book. So I began to make it a practice, commensurate with and parallel with my Old and New Testament readings to get a good, solid, not necessarily intensively technical, but exegetically responsible commentary and read the commentary through from beginning to end in conjunction with no sermon preparation, 
Al Martin sitting in his prayer and reading chair wanting to know his Bible. Lord, I want to know my Bible. And it's amazing how many commentaries I've read through from beginning to end several times. And each time I come back to it, I say, oh God, I forgot so much. The leakage just seems to get larger with the passing of the years. But I'm not giving up. I want to go to my grave knowing my Bible. To me, the greatest thing that was said of John Bunyan, Spurgeon said, prick him anywhere and out comes Bibeline. Prick him anywhere. The man knew his English Bible, knew it through and through. He thought in biblical categories. Brethren, if we are to have ministries that are ministries of the word, if we are to truly be a gift of Christ that in his hands equips the saints, enables the saints to become mature and stable and useful in Christ, we must be men who know our Bibles. And then my third line of exhortation or observation is, brethren, jealously guard the use of your time in relationship to what I would call diversionary or recreational mental activities. For you, the newspaper may be a diversional, recreational, mental activity. Certain magazines, you may like popular science, or you may like browsing the internet, not allowing yourself to see things your eyes ought not to see, but simply inquiring about what knowledge you may gain. With all the stuff that is available to us to come through our eyes and into our brains, you need to resolve, I can only know so much in this life about everything. One thing I want to know is my Bible. I want to know my Bible. And I say to you younger men, who can get so easily fascinated with books. And when you get together, what are you reading? What are you reading? And we can be engaging in a kind of intellectual one-upmanship. Resist that temptation and say, I'm going to learn what's in my Bible. And what's in my Bible, I want to be in here, and I want it to be up here. Make your ambition that it could justly be said of you what was said of that man, Apollos. Acts 18.24 he was mighty in the scriptures. I love that, mighty in the scriptures. When he began to open his mouth, you said, hey, this ain't no lightweight. This ain't no boy. He's mighty in the scriptures. John Owen had occasion to remark, and I couldn't track down where I first read it, that some were admitted to the pastoral office whose knowledge of the content of scripture would hardly suffice to gain them admission into a well-ordered biblical church. That's almost a verbatim quote. That's a tragedy, brethren. I have sat on an ordination council where a guy couldn't even name all the books of the Bible. I kid you not. They included a Baptist in an independent Presbyterian ordination council, and the man couldn't even name the books of the Bible. Well, I'm going to pass on quickly because that clock is staring at me. The third aspect of the mind, properly furnished by Christ and fitted for this office, is not only the mind reverently submissive to Scripture, furnished with a grasp upon the basic contents of the Bible in one's primary or native language, but thirdly, a mind furnished with a basic understanding and love for the meaning, interrelatedness, and self-consistency of Scripture. We read in 2 Peter 3.16 of those who rest or twist or put on a torture rack the Scriptures, and they do this to their own destruction. We can kill ourselves with the Bible. They rest the Scriptures to their own destruction. And then Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4.1 concerning his ministry, not handling the word of God deceitfully. There is a way of handling the word of God. That's what you're handling. But it is not done honestly and artfully, but deceitfully. 
As new covenant ministers, we are commanded to hold fast the pattern, the form of sound word, 2 Timothy 1.13. Now, what does this mean in concrete terms? It means that the one who would be recognized as furnished by Christ to shepherd the flock of God as an elder laboring in the word and in doctrine must have some grasp upon these following disciplines. Now listen to me carefully. I am not saying that he must have studied these disciplines under their formal name and identification or that he would be able, if questioned, under those categories to pass a test. But in his understanding, Christ has enabled him as he has sought to absorb the message of the Word of God, he has come either viscerally or by formal instruction or by a combination of both. He has come to some basic understanding and has a love for the meaning, interrelatedness, and self-consistency of Scripture. He will have some understanding of what is called, as we identified it in the initial lecture, biblical theology. The progression of God's revelatory data throughout the history of redemption. He will know that some of the things that God did in the book of Acts are not paradigmatic for the church to the end of time, i.e., does God want this man to be an office bearer? Let's cast lots. Acts 1. There it is. Book of Acts. The Holy Ghost is going to come upon the people. That's the way the apostle did it. That's the way we're going to do it. And with great power gave the apostles witness and many signs and wonders. If we have the Holy Ghost and he's the same Holy Spirit, then we should do signs and wonders. It's in the book of Acts. And if a man doesn't know, not all that is in the book of Acts is paradigmatic for the church to the end of the age, but is part of the programmatic unfolding of the history of redemption, where God is validating the ministry of the apostles by the signs and wonders that credit their claim to be the unique representatives of the living Christ. And that's not an imposition of logic and dead Christians. It's what the text of Scripture tells us. God bore them witness with signs and wonders and diverse miracles by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. To understand why we don't lift up out of the mosaic economy directives for clothing and food and impose that upon the people of God. Some understanding of biblical theology that God is working in these epochs of redemptive history consistent with himself and with his overall purpose but not in a wooden, flattened way. And then, of course, some fundamental understanding of systematic theology. The total witness of Scripture concerning the issues that Scripture addresses. Primarily, the nature and being of God. Man as image bearer, fallen in Adam. The effects of sin. The purposes of God in remedial grace. And the work of God the Father in the sending of the Son. The Son in the giving of Himself as a ransom for sinners. The work of the Spirit in applying that which the Son has purposed, purchased and the Father has purposed. Seeing the outworking of the doctrine of the Trinity into the very fabric of redemptive grace. And you have some quotes from Owen in the light of the time. I'm not going to be able to read them to you. They are marvelous statements of how crucial it is that the one who would be given as a gift of Christ to the church have a grasp upon systematic theology and then some grasp upon historical theology. Some awareness that in that conflict begun in the garden where God's promise that a seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent, but in the process the serpent would bruise the heel of the seed of the woman. How has that worked itself out? And there I commend to you the quote by Dabney, 
uh, that is in your notes, volume 2, on page 12, on the necessity of some historical perspective in the man that would be a guide to the life of the people of God. All of these things are vital means that a man may meet the biblical requirement, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, cutting a straight course in the word of truth, or 2 Timothy 2.15, being a workman who needs not to be ashamed. And let me say quickly, by way of application, do you see the rationale for the standard classical seminary curriculum? There is a rationale for it, that a man might be furnished with these disciplines. Now, some of us were not privileged to get them that way. So we've had to bend our studies to acquire them along the way in sufficient measure that we could satisfy our consciences that we would be safe guides to God's people. And with the materials available in English and more and more in Spanish, and thank God for the labors of our brother Pinero and many others, it is inexcusable for any man aspiring to the ministry and in the ministry not to be fundamentally sound in his perspectives of biblical theology, systematic theology, historical theology, and of course, experimental theology with the things available to us, with the reprint of the Puritans who were masters of the theology of the Christian life and the theology of the heart. I'm amazed that early in my ministry, when I began to understand these things and set myself four or five pages a day, I called it the priming, the pump priming for my own devotional exercises, reading four or five pages of Flavel and Sibs and Owen. I've been amazed in reorganizing my library a few months ago to find whole sets of those things, six volumes, everything marked and underlined. I had completely forgotten. But that stuff got into my soul. And though I can't recall a lot of it, if you were to question me, it's there. It was prayed over and prayed in, was shaping and molding my mind. And who knows how many things have been proposed to my mind. And there was a grid, and there was a barrier to error, and there was a pathway into truth because of that discipline of the constant assimilation. And so I say to you men already in the office and function of a teaching, preaching elder, don't stop studying theology. Don't give up those mental disciplines by which Christ will continue to furnish your mind to be an able minister of the new covenant. Now, very quickly, the other two headings. Fourthly, a mind furnished with the necessary tools and spiritual dexterity to discover and make plain to others the meaning and the application of Scripture. Surely if Christ is giving a man as a shepherd teacher, he's going to furnish his mind with the necessary tools and spiritual dexterity to discover and then make plain to others the meaning and the application of Scripture. And I love 2 Timothy 2.7 for this reason. Paul can write to Timothy after giving him these three major metaphors of the Christian life and in particular the labors of a Christian minister. And then he says, by an imperative verb that means screw up the powers of your head, Timothy, think, consider these things, and the Lord shall give you understanding in all things. He's confident of two things, that the Lord himself must give spiritual illumination, but the stuff upon which the illuminating ministry of the Spirit works is Timothy's brain, which has the necessary tools and spiritual dexterity to discover, and then by inference to make plain to others the meaning and the application of Scripture. When we come back to that non-negotiable requirement of 1 Timothy 3.2, an apt teacher, 
Titus 1.9, that he may be able to exhort and to convict. Woven into the very fabric of those requirements is the assumption that the person who would be Christ's gift to his church will indeed have a mind furnished with the necessary tools and spiritual dexterity to make, to understand, and to make plain to others the meaning and the application of Scripture. And then very quickly, number five, the five aspects of a mind upon which and within which Christ is worked to fit that man to be an able minister, a mind disposed to and furnished with sound, practical judgment. It's perfectly possible for a man to have a mind reverently submissive to Scripture, furnished with a good general knowledge of the contents of the Bible, an accurate knowledge of the meaning and interrelatedness and self-consistency of Scripture, the necessary tools and spiritual dexterity to understand and make plain to others, but he's not fit to be an elder, certainly one not fit to labor in the word and in doctrine. Why? He just lacks good, plain horse sense, as we call it. 1 Timothy 3, 2, Titus 1, 8, the requirement for an elder, this whole family of words, sophro, sophronia, Sophroneo, it has to do with prudence and what we would call sound judgment. And it's so hard to pin it down, but you know it when you're in the presence of it, and alas, you know it when you're not in the presence of it. Someone is scatterbrained, comes up with an answer to a problem that is totally off base before the mind and judgment of any sound thinking person Samuel Miller, and this is my closing quote, and with this we'll conclude the hour, in his lovely little book on an able ministry, writes on page 7, number 2, these are the requisite gifts for this ministry, talents, by which I mean, not that every minister must of necessity be a man of genius, but he must be a man of good sense, of native discernment and discretion. In other words, a sound, respectable, natural understanding. When our blessed Lord was about to send forth his first ministers, he said to them, be wise as serpents, as well as harmless as doves. And truly, there's no employment under heaven in which wisdom, practical wisdom, is so important, or rather, so imperiously and indispensably demanded as in the ministry of reconciliation. A man of weak and childish mind, though he were as pious as Gabriel, can never make an able minister. He ought never to be invested with the office at all. For with respect to a large portion of his duties, he's utterly unqualified to perform them. He's in constant danger of rendering both himself and his office contemptible. And then skip the paragraph and go down to the last major paragraph. Though a minister concentrated in himself all the piety and learning of the Christian church, yet if he had not at least a decent stock of good sense for directing and applying his other qualifications, he would be worse than useless. Whew. That's plain talk. He had all the piety of the whole church poured into him. If he didn't have a stock of good sense, he'd be less than useless. And then he goes on to amplify it Brethren, these are the indispensable requirements of the mind that is being, has been furnished or indications of a mind furnished by Christ for this sacred and marvelous work. Let me close by asking this question. Would you have as your pastor shepherd or one of your pastor shepherds a man who lacked any one of these five things? You want a man who's got doubts about the Bible? You say, no way, I want when a man opens his Bible to counsel me, to preach to me, to guide the church, I want him to come with the authority of thus says the Lord. Would you like a man who didn't have a grasp on the basic contents of his Bible so that you didn't feel safe, that he was constantly under the pressure of the quality control of the whole of Bible whenever he dealt with any one of its parts? 
Would you want to have a man who didn't see the interrelatedness and integration of biblical truth, the various epochs in which God dealt with his people in differing ways? Would you have one who, when he handled his Bible in your presence, left you scratching your head saying, what in the world is he trying to say? Or would you have one who, though brilliant in his ability to express the truth, lacked the horse sense to deal with the most elementary problems of interpersonal relations within the leadership and among the flock of God and was just leaving a trail of ineptitude? He said, man, I wouldn't want him. Well, then don't you become that to any of God's people. I believe that these requisitions are not setting the bar too high. This is minimalist pastoral theology. May God help us to take his word seriously. Let's pray. Father, once again, we thank you for your word. Thank you that it is a lamp to our feet and a light to our pathway. Seal that word to our hearts and help us to yield to the pressure of its authority. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.